Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations, the series where we explore how global businesses are responding to the coronavirus pandemic. We're also looking to the future and asking how this crisis will reshape the world. Today's conversation will focus on how COVID-19 has exposed the vulnerability of global supply chains, a shock that could alter trends in trade and investment, manufacturing, agriculture, and logistics for years to come. As always, I'm joining you from new rural New Hampshire, a long way from Bloomberg headquarters in New York City. I'd like to welcome our global community of Bloomberg New Economy delegates who've joined us at the forum in Beijing and Singapore these past two years. We also welcome the thousands of listeners tuning in on social media and via the Bloomberg terminal. There will be opportunities throughout this conversation for real-time input from you, our audience. I encourage you to submit questions in the text box in the bottom right of your screen. I'll also invite you to vote in live polling in the top right of your screen. If at any point you encounter technical difficulties, simply refresh your browser and that should help get things back on track. We've got a terrific panel coming up that you won't want to miss. But first, I'd like to introduce the global managing partner for McKinsey and Company, Kevin Sneeder, who joins us for a fire starter conversation. Welcome, Kevin, and thank you for joining us. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Kevin, just a couple of hours ago, the chief economist of the OECD talking to Bloomberg said that he saw no swift recovery of the global economy. In fact, he said any recovery is going to be very slow, very gradual. Does this chime with what you're hearing from global CEOs? The short answer is yes, it does. Uh, I think we've moved from various letters of the alphabet. At one point, it was a V. Uh, we've heard, heard of L's. We've heard of U's. I even heard of a fat U when it came to describing the recovery. But if I had to pick a symbol now, since we're talking about supply chains, I think I'd go to a well-known apparel company's swoosh, sharp down, and then a long, slightly bumpy, slow trajectory back. In fact, if I look at the many scenarios that we've been working around, and I've looked to the one that seems to have most traction amongst CEOs, it would in fact see the global GDP not recover to where it was until the end of 2022. So that is indeed a long, slow and bumpy recovery. That seems to be where the consensus is emerging amongst the CEOs with whom I'm speaking. How are CEOs prioritizing now between, on the one hand, investors, shareholders, uh, on the other hand, their employees, uh, and just the, the, self, the instinct for self-preservation, self for survival? Well, when this began, uh, the phrase I heard when it came to really answering your question was, first and foremost, we care about our colleagues, then our customers, then cash. Actually, that remains true to this point in this whole crisis. But to that can also be added, but we also care about how we bring our businesses back. There's a recognition that maybe the toughest moments in leadership are happening right now. It's actually easier to shut something down than it is to restore it to health. And so now I think many business leaders, many CEOs are wrestling with that question. How do we bring our businesses back? But let's be clear, they're doing so, I think, in nearly all cases with a heavy emphasis on the safety of the workforce and indeed a responsibility to their customers. So they've got to reconcile all of those things. But there's no question the dialogue is shifting to how do I bring business back? So Warren Buffett is just dump the airlines. Um, we're pretty sure that a lot of small, medium-sized businesses all over the world may never come back. Who are the winners? Are there any winners out of this? Well, it's an odd term to use when yesterday we saw the number of deaths from coronavirus cross the quarter of a million mark when there are 3.6 million cases. So any commentary around winners and losers, I, I find that an odd thing to discuss. But there are some sectors of the economy that clearly have proven to be very important in these days. Much of the technology sector has clearly proven to be just that. We've become very reliant on the ability to hold conferences of the kind you and I are have engaged in right now and almost taken it for granted. So clearly those who are involved in those sectors have become vitally important. Uh, 
clearly online commerce. The providers of the food that's coming to, in many cases, to our doors have become vitally important. So you, the entertainment sector, when it comes to online entertainment, so you can clearly see that what is happening is actually an acceleration of some trends that were already in there. And they've just been given a massive boost because of our need to find new ways to do things that we value and enjoy. And so those are the sectors that I think have seen the greatest boost. But let's also be cautious in trying to overread the tea leaves in terms of how what is happening now will or will not continue. Because one of the things that we're going to have to wrestle with is human spirit and endeavor. And how will people want to gather, congregate, be part of large groups is something which I think we need to think hard about. I accept and believe that that behavior will be changed fundamentally, but I'm not yet ready to, to concede that we'll completely move to everything being online and in the ways in which we've led our lives over the last few months. So before we get to specifically to supply chains, I've got to ask you this. Uh, on Wall Street, stocks are trading not far off their historic highs at a time when the global economy is falling off a cliff and may never recover, and certainly not if we get into another trade war, which seems to be uh, a new and emerging risk. What's happening here? Is this some kind of colossal market misread, or uh, what are we missing? Where's the disconnect? Well, there is a disconnect, at least at one level, and it's very... Uh, tempting to say the market is wrong and in fact because when i sit there and rationalize i'm reminded of what some wise person said to me which is we are living through a time when we've seen the great depression or the equivalent of the great depression in terms of size happening at the speed with which the 1987 crash took place and overlaid on top of that the fear that we had after 9 11 and yet and yet as you rightly point out april saw the market have the biggest single month of gains since 1987 how does one reconcile that? Well, I guess the only way to do so is to go back to basic theory and say what it really is saying is that somehow the terminal value of all these stocks, in other words, the long term picture is going to be such that it outweighs this near term disruption, but that we are going to revert to roughly where we started. That's a pretty bold statement, if that's what you believe the market is saying. And we can overlay into that lots of arguments about the theoretical impact of low interest rates and discount rates. And trust me, I've had lots of interesting discussions with our own economists to try and explain this. But I do think it comes back to this notion that we're actually not going to return to what we thought the future would be. I don't think anyone's saying that. But ultimately, we believe in the long run demand and supply will come into balance. And it will actually lead to very significant realignments within the market. So you can see that not all sectors are performing in line with the market average. Let's be very clear on that fact. But that we're actually going to return to a market which is not incorrectly valid because it believes that long term we are going to bounce back. The question is how long, and then you're into monetary theory uh, land, which I'm happy to engage in. But I think we then get into some fairly heavy discussion. We can around discount rates for another time. So um, let's let's go to yeah, a, uh, an audience poll. <laughs> right. Let's get to an audience poll, Kevin, uh, and then get your reaction to that. Um, in response. Uh, to COVID-19. Countries all over the world have been closing borders to the flow of both people and goods and services, which begs the question, is globalization over? And here are the options uh, for our uh, audience poll. Yes, the big trend is nationalism. Not really, but expect onshoring of drugs and medical gear. U.S.-China decoupling, yes, end of globalization, no, final option, no. Cost and efficiency will always win out. Um, Kevin, I wanted to ask you, are we uh, confusing a specific problem with medical supply chains and distribution and manufacturing and capacity with a more general problem with supply chains? And if so, is there a danger that we could damage those supply chains that have been so instrumental in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the emerging world and building a middle class from China to Ethiopia? That's a very important dialogue and there is that risk because let's be clear, if the world was to retrench its supply chains, then that will do real damage to some parts of the world and you name them.
that have been able to lift people out of poverty on the fact that we now have got these distributed supply chains out there. And I, at the same time, I think we have to recognize that one of the responses to this crisis has been that borders are back. Whether we like it or not, borders have been put back in place under the pretext and importantly, for good reasons around health. But once they're there, how quickly will they come down? And if they don't come down quickly, even though you can get into an argument, and I think there's a very valid argument that says having supply chains that are distributed around the world is actually a way to diversify and reduce risk. Nevertheless, nevertheless, if actions taken by governments on behalf of their citizens restrict the movement of goods, then it's a theoretical argument because in practice, we're going to have to change the way we do things. And I think therein lies the real debate. So I can tell you there's no question that we're going to see, I believe, a real move towards emphasizing resilience, at least the equal of efficiency. And that means we will probably shift from what some have said is a just-in-time economy to a just-in-case economy, where we need to have robustness, resilience in the events that we've just lived through and be more confident about being able to retain supply. And I don't think that's just related incidentally to vaccines. But overlaid on top of that is going to be this very real return of borders and with that a mindset that says distances back for all that we've gone through in Europe from the 90s onwards where we predicted and indeed lived through the death of distance because of technology now we've seen a return of distance and it's physical distance but it's also mindsets how people feel about things that come from far away so I think there are some real barriers to be overcome here and I do absolutely agree with you the consequences of the rhetoric around let's reshore onshore need to be thought through in terms of inequality, what it does to the world, how it actually plays across, because it would be a very different world than the one we were originally foreseeing. And that debate is an important one to have. One last question on US-China. Relation, the relationship seems to be going from bad to worse. We've already seen decoupling in certain areas of technology and in manufacturing, investment, certainly talent, perhaps now even in the realm of finance. How far does this go? Well, I think it's gone quite far in terms of rhetoric, but the substance hasn't yet caught up with it. So the question is, at what point will the reality of what's happening really change? I think there's a couple of things worth keeping in mind. In 2008, when the great financial crisis, the global financial crisis happened, it was easy to blame the financial institutions, the banks in particular. As we wrestle with coronavirus, people are going to look for things to blame, and we're seeing that already. Some will blame governments. I'm not going to get into whether that's justified or not, but clearly that's happening. As that happens, the question is what actions follow? And I think at this point in time, there are a few realities that we just need to keep in mind. One is if you take China very specifically, China is actually less dependent on the world than the world is in China, because China is a massive domestic economy. It does export, but it actually exports a relatively modest part of its production. If you compare that with Germany, Germany is an export economy that very much depends on being able to send its cars and other industrial products around the world. Germany is actually the one that stands to lose most if barriers go up. But this issue of the US-China relationship clearly is of massive importance. It's geopolitics writ large, because I do think we are ultimately wrestling with two powers, each of which has a vital role to play in the global economy. When both actually worked and both are firing on all cylinders, then the whole global economy does better. But we're now entering into a period where clearly the lack of stability in that relationship is having very real consequences. And you can see it in terms of the decline of M&A, the way in which your goods are flowing, the impact on commodity prices. So I think it's a political question you're asking me, and I'm not a politician, but I can tell you that on the ground, we're watching very carefully, and in particular how this plays out on technology, I think is going to be the real battleground, because let's also remember, China imports more semiconductors than it does oil. And that tells you something about the nature of the dialogue that's going on. Yeah. Kevin, before you leave us, um, let's take a look at the results of our poll. Uh, is globalization over? Um, yes, the big trend is nationalism. Only 5% support that thesis. Uh, expect uh, reshoring of drugs and medical gear. Uh, US-China decoupling, yes. End of globalization, no. 38%. Uh, with a surprising, perhaps, 24% still thinking, still believing that you know, um, globalization as we know it will continue. Does that surprise you, the results? 
Well, it surprises me a little. Uh, if I had to have a phrase that's been stuck in my head, and I wrote an article on this recently, which was by the great American philosopher Yogi Berra, who plays a terrible game called baseball, when he said the future ain't what it used to be. I think that applies to globalization. Globalization ain't what it used to be. Yes, we're going to see data and related flows, but let's also remember this. The physical movement of goods has been in decline for many years, and it suffered a major, major decline when we saw the 2008-2009 financial crisis hit the world, after which physical goods declined significantly. The IMF, I saw a forecast this year, an 11% decline in global trade. So it's hard to square that with the notion that globalization, as we know it, is going to return or continue. I think we are seeing a very fundamental change and we need to get used to it. Kevin Sneeder, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your insights. It's good to have you with us. So now I want to introduce our panel, um, all of them deeply engaged in global supply chains. Um, Sarah Menke is the founder and CEO of Grow Intelligence, a New York-based agriculture and data company. She was formerly a Wall Street commodities trader. Good morning to you, Sarah. Good morning. Victor Fung is group chairman of the Fung Group. He built a business that became the world's largest supplier of consumer goods, acting as a bridge between China and the world. Thank you for joining us, Victor. Thank you, Andy. Christian Lang is co-founder, CEO, and chairman at Trade Shift, which connects business, business buyers and sellers on the largest digital commerce platform of its kind. Hello and welcome, Christian. Thanks, Andy. Christian, I'd like to start with a question for you. Trade Shift has one and a half million companies buying and selling on its digital platform. As CEO, you have visibility into all of this activity. Give us a snapshot. What is the data telling you about the state of the global economy right now and supply chains? I mean, I think Kevin is, is spot on with the trend that he's pointing out, right? That physical goods has been trending downwards for, for a long period of time. Um, just in March, we had a 63% drop in cross-border trade uh, on the platform pretty much overnight. We had huge spikes in pharma in Europe in February and curiously, curiously in US in, in March and April. So you could also pretty much see when every single you know country was, was reacting to the current situation. Uh, now you're seeing spikes in food. Uh, so food supply chains are, are definitely uh, ramping up fast uh, and, and people are trying to, to secure supply. But I think, um, the cross-border trade drop was was the largest we've ever seen and the fastest we've ever seen. It's come back a little bit as, as capacity came online again in China, um, but it's also very real. There's not a lot of places for that capacity to go yet, except if it's PPE or pharma, right? Victor, um, Li and Fong built the supply chains that enabled globalization. What are you seeing in your own business right now that may give us clues as to where globalization is going? Well, I think what we've seen over the last decade is that the supply chains in the world are really now affected by a number of major trends. What has been happening is the technology trend, as we all know, has actually really done a lot of disruption to the supply chain. And we're now adjusting globally, actually, to an omni-channel world. And then in the last two years, as we've just discussed, uh, the idea of the geopolitics is now also affecting the supply chain and with the trade conflicts and so on. What we really see now is the third major shift that is also going to redo the supply chains of the future. And that is unfortunately the pandemic. We have to adjust to these three realities, making a dramatic shift in the supply chains in the world. So as far as I can see, the supply chains will be adjusting to that. And what I think we really need to be thinking about is as we think about the future of the supply chains, we gotta do it right this time. We have gotta do it with really, uh, focus on the sustainability of the supply chain, the equitable growth, and now very importantly, as everybody has now think, the foremost in any CEO's mind is the safety of their workers and their other stakeholders. So we really have an opportunity now 
to actually think about the future of the global supply chains, how we might actually deal with all these issues in the supply chain of the future. It will be a digitalized global supply chain that will actually deal with all the issues that we've just mentioned. Sarah, you've been warning for several years now about a global food crisis for countries in the developing world, particularly Africa and the Middle East that are dependent on global supply chains, long intercontinental supply chains. Is COVID-19 the tipping point? It unfortunately looks like it could be. Um, and, and a lot of the argument, um, you know, and I think you're referring to a talk I gave in 2017 about this, and it was about, you know, basically structure, the structural capacity to supply the markets that are demanding food to not being able to meet that. And it's because we've built a, a, a food system globally that is made up of net importers of calories and net exporters of calories. And your net exporters were basically the United States, uh, South America, mainly Brazil and Argentina. Now Russia and Ukraine emerging as net exporters and the biggest net importers of calories really being China and Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Um, and so right now you're essentially seeing that play out. Um, and the reason that China is a little protected from this in, 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 in some ways is that it's made massive investments in the past decade, but also has the financial resiliency to have had stockpiles domestically to be able to deal with trade disruptions in a way that most, especially sub-Saharan African countries just don't have. You mentioned Russia. Russia is threatening right now to curtail wheat shipments. Vietnam has halted rice contracts. Where is this all heading? I mean, um, you know, that what, when Russia um, decided to curtail wheat exports, it was largely driven by the, the, the oil price war. Um, you know, basically the, the decline in oil prices led to a drastic uh, devaluation and depreciation of the ruble. Um, and so the domestic price of wheat, even though wheat prices had not moved on a dollar basis, you know, surged 30 percent. Um, and, you know, food security is ultimately national security. And so the the risk of getting, you know, strikes on on the roads and the streets was much greater than the incremental dollar that you would make that Russia actually desperately needs. Russia needs those wheat exports. But um, it's it's I think what we're seeing is this play of food securities, national security. And, you, you know, you mentioned that, you know, the Dow and the S&P 500 haven't changed much this year. And, and, and it's frankly, largely also due to the fact that the U.S. dollar has become the reserve currency of choice. So every other country in the world, you know, currencies are, are down 15 to 25 percent in many, many parts of the world. Um, so it's just a move of, of protecting uh, your people, avoiding revolutions. Victor, on the manufacturing side, we're seeing economies all over the world going into survival mode. How worried are you about this instinct to, pre to protect local jobs, local industries? Yesterday, the White House tweeted this, America can never again let our supply chains be held hostage by China or any other country. Are we about to see a massive new wave of protectionism? Well, I think this movement actually has been going on for a little while now. And in fact, we've been dealing with it on a global basis. I think the key that we need to remember is this global supply chain that we've built over the last 30 years have really brought a huge amount of prosperity to the whole world. And we really need to do everything we can to preserve it. I think the interdependence between the different economies have really been highlighted by this um, very, you know, uh, dangerous pandemic, because unless we're able to actually fight this pandemic together, we're going to have a very hard time fighting it on our own. And this really emphasizes the need for solidarity and cross-border cooperation. And I think that actually extends to the world. I think the biggest issue on everybody's mind now is obviously, how do we put an end to this uh, global pandemic? But having said that, every businessman is also thinking, how do we get the global economy going again? And once you think that way, and I also, I think once you start thinking about how we revive the global economy, 
then I think almost every supply chain you can think of is really stretching across countries and across borders. While there is a, a growing tendency to want to keep certain things on a domestic context, and we've been talking about reshoring for, for a while now, I think unless it's government mandated, like in a health uh, basis, I think it's really almost impossible to actually keep your supply chains completely domestic. So I, I think in order to, to think about the, the whole idea of uh, a more resilient supply chain, the answer definitely is not to close your borders and make everything domestic. I think the whole sort of re, uh, uh, way to deal with the having a more resilient, uh, the need for a more resilient supply chain is really think about diversification. What you really need is on a global basis to think double source, triple source, and so on, so that you build a lot more slack into the supply chains and a lot more robust supply chains so you can actually deal with this uh, phenomenon and be able to actually manage the risk in the global supply chain and not Chris, to close Chris, your borders. Christian, let me ask you about that. I mean, so when you double down, triple down on your supply chains, aren't you also adding to your risk of goods crossing yet more borders? Um, isn't that a, isn't, doesn't that add in some ways to your insecurity? I think uh, fundamentally we have two issues with modern supply chains. Uh, one is that they might be digital on top, but they're physical and paper on the bottom. So even before we talk about goods, uh, imagine every single time you have a supply chain transaction that's actually generated a physical piece of paper that's moved somewhere. Uh, that stopped in February. We had customers that had 3 million transactions sitting in mail rooms uh, that they couldn't actually process. Uh, so, so I think we have a tendency to think in 2020, our supply chains are very digital. They're not. Um, it's, it's fake digitalization, if you want. And I think that's going to be a huge challenge. And I think the second piece is we got to throw out the playbook on how we design supply chains. I mean, supply chain, modern supply chain design is invented by MBAs in the 80s. It's great for driving out costs. It's, it's essentially just uh, implementation of the Toyota principles everywhere, right? Uh, lean, just in time, no inventory. Um, but if I designed a cloud computing platform in such a way that if one server fell over, we had global unavailability, I would be fired as a cloud computing provider. Um, and I think we need to start thinking about those principles. We need to start thinking about that resiliency that we actually have learned to build in a lot of systems and apply that in other areas, right? Like we talk in computing, we talk about microservices, we talk about flexibility, we talk about redundancy as, as Victor is, is talking about multi-sourcing. And I think all of the technology to do that is there. Um, so it's not that we can't have much more distributed manufacturing. And then the last bit on, on the borders, right? I mean, crossing borders even today is actually very complex, but people don't see it because we are integrated into custom systems. There's fast lanes, there's all of this stuff. I'm more concerned about people than I am about goods because there's already a big infrastructure around goods crossing borders. And Yes, it's going down, but it's not going to disappear. And I think that's one area where I'm actually very optimistic that the tools and the processes and the shippers and all of that is very advanced. But I think for people, it's going to be more complicated. It, rather, than, rather than reinventing or compl further complicating supply chains, dispersing supply chains, isn't a simpler, simpler answer stockpiling? And particularly when it comes to medical equipment, which really is the heart of the problem right now. I think, look, uh, if you look at the UK, right, uh, if they had before this crisis, uh, the cost of buying enough PPE to support the UK till the end of 2022 would have been around $5 billion. Uh, for the US to have enough ventilators to support even the largest imaginable spike would have been around $12 billion before the crisis, right? Uh, so, the, so the incremental cost of having capacity in the healthcare system to handle these things is actually extremely small. Um, and it's not that we lack the manufacturing, we can easily manufacture those vent ventilators, we can easily manufacture that PPE. So I think, especially in healthcare, I think uh, just-in-time supply chains is a crime. Uh, and, and I think when we're dealing with health and people's lives, I actually think that's something where government needs to step in and mandate resiliency. And, and I think Kevin's just-in-case principle here is, is absolutely the one that I have to apply. Sarah, in the agricultural space, what does, resi what does resilient supply chains mean? I mean, it's, it's somewhat similar in the sense that 
you know, not having sufficient food in stockpile is a crime. It's, 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 it's making sure that populations are fed and, and that you're on top of essentially what local production is. So it's, it, it's investing in increasing local production, but it's also in ensuring that you have a fundamental feel for what global supply and demand balances are and are managing that on a much more real time basis. And the cost of doing that because of the data that's available and how cheap it is now is actually very low. Um, the second part is, is really about how food and, uh, you know, manufacturers of food, com food companies, retailers, etc. Again, you know, if you look at uh, the balance sheets and you look at, you know, the, the, the 10Ks of a lot of publicly listed companies and you see how much of their supply chain they hedge forward and buy forward, it's almost nothing. You know, it's it's typically and 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 that, by the way, if you look at the energy industry, why it lit, you know lives to see another day right now, despite oil prices, is that a lot of oil producers had gone out and sold oil forward ten years in advance, you know, uh, <laughs> years ago, and so they they still have you know some of that to to kind of live off of. Food companies are are buying you know, one week at a time, one year at a time at best, um, that needs to start to change. They need to start thinking longer term, especially if you're going to see structural shifts in supply chains, that investment needs to happen across an industry. So it needs to happen end to end, but it needs to be much long term, much longer term capital allocation, which the food industry has never seen, which is insane to me because it's been around for 12,000 years. Let's get to a let's get to a question from the audience. Um, this one comes from James uh, Ro, Rowey in Singapore. James is the head of operations in Asia Pacific for Maersk, the shipping giant, and he asks, "Do you expect that there will be a shift away from just-in-time style supply chains of major manufacturers together, or instead of regionalization and reshoring?" Um, who wants to take that one? Yeah. Well, I, I think let me let me take that. and just to add a point to the point that we were discussing earlier i think it's going to be a trade-off between resilience and efficiency as it all it has always been i don't think either extreme is going to work we did swing too much one way it's all about efficiency or time period and now we realize the fallacy of that and we've got to go back to this idea of diversification but i'd like to make two points the first is, I think just, I, I do agree that there are more difficulties uh, crossing borders for both people and goods right now. However, I do believe that technology should really be able to address a lot of those issues. And the more we use those technology platforms, the easier it would be to move across borders, despite all the, diff uh, you know, sort of the barriers uh, coming in its place. But there's one important trend uh, that's happening globally I like to just put into the discussion. I think if you look at consumption in the world, there's actually been a dramatic shift over the last 30 years. And if you look forward to the next 30 years, it will be even more dramatic. In the following sense, if you go back to the 1980s, the bulk of the world's consumption was done in the OECD countries, the, the developed countries more than 80% if I remember my figures right. And then the non-OECD countries, especially in Asia and now but beginning increasingly also in Africa, I think will be uh, uh, you know, increasing, the, taking a bigger share of the consumption pie. Today, I think the number is 65% is still in the OECD countries. But if you look forward to 2040 and maybe at most to 2050, I think the bulk of the consumption will actually be in the developing countries, especially Victor, in Asia. Victor, Asia, we, I we think, accounts for part. Victor, yeah. we've got a we have a we have a chart that I think we can put up, um, ah. which illustrates okay. uh, what you're talking about. You want to here. put it up first? Uh, not, yeah. not, not okay. Not, not that not that one. Sorry, that's 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 a. Um, <laughs> That, that's that's a different one, but but we can we can. Uh, this is the one. Here here you go. A, this is this is McKinsey Mc, McKinsey Global Institute. I think Asia could drive fifty percent of global uh, consumption by two thousand and and thirty. So you know, talking about moving supply chains out of China out of Asia, how does that make sense when almost all of the growth in consumption 
in the world in the next decade or so is going to be coming from Asia Pacific. See, that, that's exactly, Andy, the punchline. You see, if you go back the last decades, the stuff were really made in one part of the world and shipped to another part of the world for consumption, if you think of it that way. Increasingly, the people that are making the goods are also consuming the goods. So in a sense, that's less need for even cross-border uh, right. uh, shipments and so on. You, you see, so, so I think that is a major trend and any global company looking at the situation is really got to account for this new consumption that's coming up right. in Asia. How do we go after it? Uh, how do we access it? Right, Christian, let's, let's, go, back, let's go back to that, that previous chart that we had up. Um, this one is from uh, Inodo uh, Economics, part of our uh, Bloomberg New Economy uh, Forum. Um, so uh, this is a, uh, a graphic that looks at reshoring and they've ranked uh, industrial sectors by the likelihood that they'll shift production back to the US. So we've got automob uh, automobiles, we've got electrical machinery. I see, by the way, that the Commerce Department is, is uh, launched a, a inquiry into uh, critical elect electrical parts uh, in the electrical power grid with the, the view to perhaps reshoring production in that sector. Christian, how can companies right now afford to spend the massive amount of money that it will require to reshore production, uh, particularly if reshoring production uh, will involve uh, investment in automotive technologies? Where's the money going to come from? Where is the incentive coming from right now for businesses to do this? I think reshoring is, is, is the wrong word that describes the wrong movement. I think it's multi-shoring. Because um, just to be clear, right, during the trade war, very little manufacturing actually moved out of China is exactly because of the reasons you just showed before. There's not a Western company that, that don't understand that they need to have manufacturing in China if they want to sell to Chinese consumers. Um, but what you are going to see is much more multi-shoring, meaning you're also going to have manufacturing capacity in the West, which has been a long time for a lot of these Western companies since they had. And I think... Um, you know, if you're looking at large players, they can obviously really afford this. I mean, if you're looking at, you know, technology like Apple and others, they have more than enough cash in the balance sheets. Uh, for auto, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Um, I think they're going to lean on uh, Mexico. They're going to lean on Latam. They're going to lean on, on some of the other manufacturing hubs. Um, but the other trend I think we're going to see, and this is going to be a little longer, it's five to ten years, is a lot more, I won't say robotic factories, but I would say close to dark factories where a lot of the workforce might not even be in the country. Uh, so you might have, uh, you know, robots that are completely autonomous and you might have robots that are human operated, but those human operators might very well be in India or China, right? So, so we can have, uh, you know, production capacity in the US or in the West that's managed and operated elsewhere. So, so I think you need to have a bigger imagination of what reshoring means, because I think if you just think reshoring and think about taking what we have today, and putting in, and I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think we're going to have a diversification of services, production capacity, and it's all going to be very technology driven, um, much more than we see today. Okay, let me let me put a question to all of you, starting with with, with Sarah. Um, the the world is is, is about to face uh, its most complex logistical challenge, perhaps uh, in history, um, which is the production and distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine, if we ever get one, to 7 billion people in the planet, every person on Earth. And that's uh, assuming that it's just going to be one dose. If it's going to require two doses, then we now have four, four, 40 uh, bi billion doses. First of all, you know, uh, how is that going to happen at a time when countries all over the world are putting up barriers to the export of medical supplies? where you're talking, people are talking about vaccine nationalism, where we have medical supply piracy on the high seas, where the WHO is being uh, underfunded or defunded by the United States. Sarah, what are, the what are the risks here? I mean, one of them seems to be, you know, a scenario where you get a vaccine and countries in Africa basically are going to have to take their, their place at the bottom of the queue. 
Yeah, but the, the, the economic cost of doing that is so much higher. I mean, I keep reminding people that, you know, U.S. prosperity and European prosperity came as a due to global prosperity. And if you end up in, in these vaccine wars and, you know, vaccine nationalism, I guess you're also succumbing to the fact that you're going to have to shut your borders down and not let people move around, including U.S. companies that are going to want to do business in, you know, in the countries that that are the, 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 where consumption is increasing the most. Right. So it's it's it, it's kind of it, it's it's almost nonsensical to think that there's going to be a version of you know, giving one vaccine at a time and picking and choosing which countries get it and which countries don't, because the cost of doing that is simply too high just from a like selfish risk standpoint, right? So if all you care about is yourself, then you should actually care about everybody getting vaccinated for the world to kind of resume to some type of normal, whatever that new normal is. Um, so, I, you know, I do think it does worry me that we're seeing much more of this nationalism towards medical equipment, et cetera. But on, on the flip side, um, I think we all have to remember that, you know, it, it, the prosperity one place was a function of prosperity everywhere. And if, and if we truly believe that that's going to be different, then, you know, I, th I guess we should all believe that we're going to be working from home uh, for a couple more years, not not a couple more months, uh, and uh, and all that. So, Victor, technically, do you do you think the world is up to the challenge? Well, I, actually, I, I I agree completely with Sarah. I think we need to really understand the notion that with a pandemic like this, none of us none of us are safe unless everybody is safe. So we really have a vested interest to keep everybody safe and not just really worried about uh, what you call sort of, uh, you know, different uh, uh, type of barriers to uh, movements, et cetera. I think to answer the question directly, I think technically, uh, if you think about the distribution issues, I think it can be resolved. The only thing I worry about is if this vaccine uh, needs a refrigerated supply chain, a cold chain. Then I think uh, we're in a pretty uh, tough territory, uh, but I think it is possible. But I do think also that we need to think about not just big manufacturing points and distribute using logistics to the entire world, but distributed manufacturing in different parts of the world so that you can do a lot more local distribution. And uh, I think getting the, the vaccine to the right place is only a part of the problem is actually how do you administer the vaccine and et cetera, et cetera. It, it really depends a lot on the in-country healthcare systems. So I, I think that there are, there are a number of issues. That last mile issue, I think, is an important one as well. But okay. the last thing I would say, though, and that, oh, sorry, okay. Just, just one point. This really points out, this, this particular example really points out the need for us to think about how we run the world going forward, the solidarity and the cooperation we really need around the world. The whole idea that maybe we need to have a new multilateralism, one that actually knits the global community together to actually make all of us safe. And then that should extend to other things that we do as a global community. Okay, this, this is a good time to bring in our, our second polling question. Um, here it is. If global supply chains shrink, what factors will most likely influence where goods are manufactured? National security, proximity to consumers, automation technologies, tariffs, and protectionism, nudges from governments perhaps to reshore. Um, while we're waiting on the results of that second audience poll to come in, here's another audience question. This one from Alexander Malaket and uh, Alexander is the president of Opus Advisory Services International in Canada. And he asks, is this a question of reconfiguration or politicization of supply chains? Reconfiguration without a rethink about the character of supply chains will not guarantee resilience. Alternative suppliers, adequate financing and engaging the long tail are key. Christian. Yeah, I think um, this is something we talk with a lot of our customers and CEOs about every day. 
And I think um, the modern supply chain model was invented after the Second World War. Um, and it's it's basically built off the idea that we have centralized hub that coordinate everything and then you build for that centralized hub around the world. And we only been able to, if you look at a modern software system, you can pretty much measure two factors. You can measure measure cost and you can measure what, what, what you get in. But you know very little about the, the impact, the footprint of your supply chain in many different ways, right? Um, you know, before all of this, it seems like 10,000 years ago in, in, in Davos uh, earlier this year, everybody was agreeing that that private sector needed to look at a lot more impacts. And I think it was sort of a big moment where people said, look, um, if you're in the beverage industry, you should care about water supply. If, you, if you're in all of these other industries, you care about these things. So I think that's one thing when you think about impact. But the other thing about these hugely centralized supply chains and not decentralized manufacturing that Victor is talking about is, they're also centralizing jobs and creating some very skewed political effects inside countries, right? Uh, we saw the ho hollowing out of, of the UK, of middle America from a manufacturing perspective. Um, and, and I think that's actually what destabilized a lot of the political base, right? Um, populism, uh, I mean, pandemics don't care about populism, I think is, is, is a good thing. Um, but I do think we really need to think about what are the socioeconomic impacts of how we structure our supply chains, not from a do good perspective, but certainly from an economic impact as well, right? If, if borders get tighter because we're not spreading around the jobs, if we're not spreading around the wealth, um, then we have a problem as business. So, so I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's a big moment right now where we can actually rethink a lot of those things. And as I said before, you know, COVID-19 is in many ways the great revealer. Um, we have all the technology, you know, all of the companies that are running fake digitalization right now have a massive problem and all the ones that done it right they're, they're in, a, in a good spot. And the same with production. Um, all of the companies that are thinking about what does this mean for production of the future, they will be in a very, very good position uh, for where we're going. But I can guarantee it won't look like what we have today. Sarah, I want to come back to you. Um, COVID-19 is just one threat to the global uh, food supply chain. Not, by no means the only one. On top of everything else, East Africa now is under attack by swarms of locusts. Is this the start, do you think, of a whole new era of food insecurity? Um, it is. Um, it's um, the swarm of locusts uh, in East Africa that have spread to actually the Middle East. Um, so they're in uh, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Iran have found their way into Pakistan and, and India by June, and if, if not contained, can actually make their way to China as well. Um, these, these swarms of locusts are, are threatening the lives of you know, potentially 200 million people um, in terms of extreme poverty this year, uh, just because there were such delays in being able to essentially fight them off. Um, the breeding uh, that's occurring is at a rapid you know, pace. This is all driven by climate. Um, and, and the fact that rains are coming significantly sooner than expected, so treatment can't happen before the crops are planted. Um, and so in a country like Ethiopia, you know, you could end up having, um, you know, close to $4 billion in, uh, in lost production, which is not insignificant. And that's looking at relatively conservative assumption that, that locusts would essentially destroy about 50% of the crop of the area that they're in. Um, in the past, it's been up to 80%. And this is because this particular species of locust is a desert locust. It consumes its body weight's worth of food a day, and they travel 150 kilometers a day. So they spread very fast, they breed very fast, and, and, and climate conditions, I mean, even in Iran, are, are proving to be conducive for their breeding. Um, and so this this year, uh, to me, is is one where the world is very caught up in, in, in COVID-19, but in terms of number of lives lost in some of these countries, number of lives lost due to food insecurity could be greater than the number of lives lost due to COVID-19. Okay, let's go back to the result of our second poll, um, which is around uh, reworking supply chains. If supply chain cha chains shrink, what factors will most likely influence where goods are manufactured? Only 16% thought that national security uh, would be the top consideration. Most believe uh, proximity to consumers will be key. Automation technologies, 19%, uh, tariffs, protectionism, 23%. Uh, Victor, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I certainly, uh, uh, you know, I agree with the poll because my sense about reshoring is actually is primarily consumer driven. If the companies, the, the e-commerce companies are training consumer to expect products to be delivered to your home in 24 hours or 48 hours even, there's no way to produce it far away. You have to reshore in order to satisfy the consumer needs. So I, I think that that is probably the key thing that's driving the so-called reshoring. I, I think tariffs is an interesting issue. One thing that we have not yet spoken too much about is this whole country of origin issue. In fact, the because of tariffs, you really want to get your country of origin in the right place. And that is determined by the location in which you finish the goods. So actually, that actually would argue for a diversification of locations right. in your production, in your global supply chain. Okay, let's get to, a, we, we got a lot of questions coming in. I wanna to get to a couple of them. This one coming in from Andrew Peterson, the CEO of the Business Council for Sustainable Development in Australia. He, he's, he asked, before COVID, many were calling for supply chains to be more transparent and accountable to stakeholders, e.g. Uh, scope three, greenhouse gas emissions, modern slavery reporting, using blockchain to track the sustainability of products, uh, seafood, palm oil, as uh, two examples he cites. What happens to those developments post COVID? I, Sarah, I think, me, go on, right, sorry, Christian, sure. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, what, 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 let's start with Christian and then we'll get to Sarah. I just want to make one quick point, which we're seeing right now live with some of the largest producers of, of for instance, using palm oil. And it got to be economic driven. So, so I think we've had transparency initiatives in a silo, and then we've had treasury and economy in a silo. And I think what we're seeing now, which is super interesting in the combination. Uh, so for instance, supply chain liquidity, supply chain finance that are linked to uh, transparency, uh, that are linked to, uh, you know, origin. So you can actually get supply chain financing roughly, you know, a 30% cheaper um, from, from green funds, if you can, you know, link it to the transparency of a lot of production methods. So I think crossing those wires, because if you just keep saying transparency to suppliers, it, it won't change anything. But if you're telling suppliers, you can get capsule faster at a lower cost if you're being transparent, then it will change a lot of things. So I think that's, you know, an interesting trend that started before and I actually seen it just continue. I haven't seen it slow down. Sarah, what's your what's your uh, answer to that question? I mean, it, it's it's somewhat similar to, to what Christian is saying, but um, but I'll also add to it the fact that I have you know somebody who's been uh, running a company focused on global food systems and global agricultural systems. It was always viewed as a as almost like you know there's a set group of people that think about this issue, and most consumers never really thought where their food came from. I've never seen more reporters reporting about food and where our food com comes from and people asking these questions. And so I think all of us are starting to have a much deeper personal connection to the, you know, speaking to, to food and agricultural products, to, to asking questions of, you know, why is this more expensive? Where did it come from? Why is this food not on my shelf all of a sudden? Because I never understood that there was seasonality to the fruit that I consumed and, you know, <laughs> trade slowing down would mean that I can't find it every day of, 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 of the year. And so I think that mindset by the consumer will also continue to basically, you know, keep the pressure on companies to increase transparency. And actually, I think they'll have to think of transparency in ways that literally transfers down to the consumer at a level that maybe hasn't even happened before. But I, I do think that I say everyone has become a food reporter right now, so it's, right. Uh, it, it won't change things. <laughs> Question just came in from Belize from Magda Theodate. He was the director of global executive trade consulting. And he asks, uh, or she asks, I, I, I do apologize uh, if I got that wrong. Um, um, how should the private sector respond to government export bans, particularly of critical needs during a time when demand outweighs supply? Victor, how should governments respond? Well, I, how, sorry, how should the private sector respond? To to government government? Okay. 
Well, I, I, I think obviously the first thing we do is obey all the government regulations. I mean, there's no, no other ands or buts. But if we're trying to ultimately achieve a certain product, I think there are many ways to actually um, achieve that goal while actually respecting all the government regulations. This goes back to the idea of diversification, uh, assembling goods from many locations, and then putting it all together again in the, in the appropriate package with total transparency. By the way, I agree with what, what my fellow panelists have just said. I think transparency is here to stay and total traceability of the supply chain all the way you know, back to the farm or wherever you, know, you start is, is, is here to stay with the technology. So I think there are ways to respect totally uh, the, the government regulations and yet actually achieve the objective of getting the right product to the consumer at the right time. We've, we've got about two minutes left, which is just about time for one more question. This one for you, Sarah. This, it, this comes from Thomas Barr, the Managing Director of Lions Wing Capital in the US. He says, what risks does climate change present to the stability of global, uh, uh, of global supply chains in the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a very big question that doesn't have a simple answer. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, when we talk about climate change, we oftentimes use blanket statements as if it's, you know, going to be good or bad for all. And the reality is that it's a very complicated set of outcomes, meaning that when you look at the climate scenarios that are out there and you actually start to do long term projections of what yields will be and production of food will be in different parts of the world, you see different impacts. So, for example, if you use one of the baseline scenarios, it's called the B1 scenario. So it's kind of like a mid level scenario. You will see yields of soybeans in Brazil declining over time, but you will see yields in Russia increasing over time. Um, and so there's there's just different outcomes based off different scenarios and different outcomes for different countries. And so we're only now starting to basically leverage all that we know about the research done in climate change and apply it to predictive models that now actually let us forecast the actual physical outcome tied to a very specific industry. Um, and so the, the reality is that, you know, diversification of supply chains just because of climate change itself will also be a real thing uh, because, you know, it, 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 the, the producers now are not necessarily going to be the biggest producers 30 years from now. Okay, we've got scores more questions flooding in, uh, but we're out of time. We've covered a huge amount of ground. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Christian, uh, Victor, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. We're grateful for your participation, for your perspectives. Um, and I'd also like to extend uh, my thanks to our fire starter, Kevin Sneeder, and to our audience, both within and beyond Bloomberg New Economy Community. Thanks for joining us. We invite you to our next conversation focused on the worldwide race for a COVID-19 vaccine on Tuesday, May 19th. Follow the conversation with at New Econ Forum on Twitter or like us on Facebook. And to learn more about other upcoming events, visit our website at neweconomyforum.com. Thank you.